Thanks everyone for joining. So um, good morning, everyone. As Shannon said, my name is Divya Bhatt and I lead our product and engineering teams here. Um, I'm so excited to host this amazing panel today to discuss behavior change, which is something we really live and breathe here at Verda. Um, you know, behavior change is such a critical component to all types of medical treatments and in particular chronic disease programs. Um, affecting behavior change can come in so many forms ranging from strict medical protocols to kind of UX tricks um, used by product designers. And leveraging this suite of tools um, is particularly relevant today. So, you know, as we've all seen, you know, as America continues to struggle to make a dent in the relentless growth of chronic disease costs, um, we now also face new COVID-19 headwinds. And as patients navigate a sea of disrupted routines and new technology, uh, we really need to think from first principles about behavior change and health. Um, so looking forward to kind of diving into that today. Um, today we'll have three presenters. We have Jody Smith from WellTalk. We have best-selling author Nir Ayal. And finally, I'll share some of our efforts at Verda as a case study, and then we'll have some time for Q&A at the end. Um, so as a group, there's kind of three principles we're going to be focusing on. We'll be looking at, uh, as we talk about behavior change, we'll be looking at business strategy, consumer engagement, and real world examples. So um, first up, um, let me introduce our first panelist, Jody Smith. Um, jo Jody joined WellTalk in April 2019 as Director of Consumer Journey and has had a significant impact within her organization and the industry at large. Jody leverages new analytics tools, um, machine learning, AI, along with years of treating patients um, to help guide the consumer journey framework at WellTalk. And she, cons she consults with the industry's leading payers and providers on adopting WellTalk's health platform that connects consumers with cons community-based and other available resources like education and coaches. Um, Jody joined WellTalk to shift um, to intervene upstream by connecting the downstream dots. So, you know, if people made mild lifestyle modifications sooner, their health trajectory would be vastly improved. She brought her experience as a nurse practitioner, case manager, and health plan leader to help the company map the consumer journey and understand potential points of intervention. So with that amazing background, um, over to you, Jody. Good morning. Thank you so much, Divya. Can you hear me okay? Yep, perfect. Good morning. Well, thank you so much for having me. I just wanted to um, start with um, mostly a statement to um, health plan leaders and HR leaders to, um, it's more of a plea than a statement, to please stop investing in volume-based um, programs and start um, investing in ones that have value. It's not enough to just know um, the quantity of things that we're doing and, and it's really a, um, to what end we need to be asking ourselves. So when you consider that 75% of a person's health is attributed to um, not the clinical care and not the genetics, and it's attributed to factors like environment and lifestyle behaviors and social drivers like food insecurity or housing insecurity, job security right now with COVID, um, it's really, really important to um, realize there's a lot at stake and nearly all of what we know about a person is in that 10%. It's from our, from our clinical um, interactions. And so what's, what, what also is unfortunate is that the healthcare industry is kind of focused on not only that 10%, but on um, probably 1% of the time we have people in a clinical setting or, or interaction. So it's very, very um, kind of mismatched and malaligned, I would say. Um, and, and it's probably causing problems. I always say that taking care of chronic illness in acute models, um, is kind of the square peg round hole problem. Um, the systems we've created around a 20 minute face-to-face -face bricks and mortar um, is kind of an acute model and, and um, chronic illness requires, uh, requires a different model. Um, so 
we need to support people differently and we need different models. And so to support um, somebody's health journey, um, I, we need to go into what I like to call the in-between. So what we all need to be doing and, and building is, um, is integrating um, social supports and digital supports in between face-to-face um, -face visits. Um, and so I wanna tell you a story about Mary. Mary is a patient, was a patient of mine um, and she, at the time, was newly diagnosed diabetic, and she went to all of the um, uh, newly diabetic, diabetic classes. She met with an endocrinologist. She met with a diabetes educator. I mean, we really threw the book at her and front-loaded front -loaded her diagnosis with a lot of information. Um, she counted 250 things she needed to do to manage her diabetes. Um, and then it felt, then she was um, relaying to me that it felt a little like she was on her own. And so one day at work, actually she had a bad week at work where she was um, doing everything she was told around testing her sugars and testing her, um, yeah, testing her sugars. And she was pretty consistently high and she was confused and she didn't have any, she, she was at work and she just didn't feel really, um, supported, but she did what she was told and wrote down all her blood sugars um, on a sheet of paper. And by the time she had her next appointment, which was six weeks away, she had pages of blood sugars that were confusing to her and didn't really know the drivers um, to why she was running high. Um, and so I just wanted to use Mary as a illustration on um, on, and also what COVID is kind of illuminating for us is that we there's this desperate need um, for virtual strategies to not only reach, um, but to engage and support people when they're managing out there on their own where they live, work and play. We kind of need to meet them where they're, where they're at. Um, and so the other thing COVID has done is when you take bricks and mortar face-to-face -face, um, out of the equation, um, you know, you, we have to all be asking ourselves, how well are we set up to support Mary um, if, that's not, if that's not an option? Um, so an interesting thing about um, driving better outcomes is, um, like I've said previously, we've, um, we're focused on the 10% and the 1% of the time um, we have people in our, in our interactions and in our um, settings. Um, and to drive better outcomes, we really, really need to not only engage people, but really understand the barriers um, they're facing. So we know, and I know personally, how busy everybody is with trying to reach members and engage members. I know you're calling them. I know you're sending them reminders. I know you're sending them postcards and offering free things. Um, um, and, but what, what I don't think um, uh, large health plans or large employers are, are really understanding is what's on the right side of the, the slide here. Um, and so, traditional ways of looking um, at things with claims data and diagnostic data, medications, procedurals. Um, it's re while it's really important clinically, it actually doesn't give you um, the whole picture. And so in order to really understand people and the root causes of the, of the health outcomes you're getting and seeing is to weave in the right side. So knowing, um, their financial situation, if they and if they're food insecure, if they can afford their um, if they can afford their medications, and I always like to say when people want to stand up, um, and my my experience is in health plans when you want to stand up a disease management program, um, if the person on the left and the person on the right had the same exact hemoglobin A1C, which is a marker of kind of historic diabetes management. Um, if, if they had the same exact um, hemoglobin A1C, but the one on the left um, had a spouse that cooked healthy foods, they could afford their medications, she had a rich social network, and the one on the right um, lived alone, um, 
um, lived in a basement apartment, didn't really have good kitchen, so wasn't um, cooking a lot of fresh things and was um, eating out a lot, you're going to see much, much different health outcomes um, despite any medication titrations you do or um, even if engagement's the same. So you, you have to not only address engagement, but also um, um, the social drivers affecting the health outcomes you're seeing. Um, and so it's no surprise um, that people are facing obstacles. I think we all know that. Um, you know, just under three quarters of people have obstacles like access to and cost of healthy foods, um, don't have enough time, not enough social support. And so, um, you know, just kind of tying it into this, these COVID times, understanding that, like how, how to keep people motivated when they're at home or how to um, engage people when they're limiting trips to the store, like how are we set up to help, help those folks? Um, so just, I wanna end with and to reiterate and kind of in conclusion state that um, when you know people's social drivers and the health and you understand that the health outcomes you're seeing are um, from the 10% and the 1% of the time people are with you, um, and you, and, you under, and you can get to the root causes and understand the social drivers, you can be actually more sensitive to the needs and you can be more specific um, to, to not only stellar disease management, but to also in, engaging people like Mary. So um, my plea to everybody listening, and I, and I think that's why you've joined today, is to not only partner with, but actively seek out programs that not only operate in the 99%, but that are standing behind their value statement, not just volume around um, how many people they can reach. Very important to be at scale, but really, really important to, to show the value. And when you are able to take a member first approach, um, it can only be accomplished by understanding and predicting individual needs. And that includes social drivers and um, social determinant of health data and advanced uh, analytics. So this should be the, the point of departure for all of us going forward um, in partnering and engaging with people. So thank you so much and I will pass it back. Excellent, um, thank you so much, Jody. Um, next, I'd like to introduce Nir Ayal. Um, Nir is the author of Wall Street Journal bestselling books, Hooked and Indistract Indistractable, which have collectively sold more than 300,000 copies worldwide. From authoring columns at the New York Times to coaching executives at the Stanford Graduate School of Business and School of Design, Nir draws from his, his diverse background to really push the envelope on his life's work, philosophy, psychology, technology, and business. So thanks and over to you, Nir. Thanks so much. Can you confirm for me that you can see the slide? Yep, I see you and I hear you. All right, terrific. Well, hello everyone. I'm so glad you could join me today. Uh, join us, I should say, and thank you so much for hosting. Uh, today we're going to talk about these, be, these products that we see everyone carrying around these days to try and understand what is it about these technologies that make them so habit forming in order to understand how we can learn these patterns for ourselves in order to change patient behavior in our in our own industry and so the idea here is we want to get a little bit outside of healthcare for a minute because you know i really believe that if we want to be better at whatever it is we want to do. We want to look at the best in the business, right? We want to find who is doing what we want to do better than anyone else. And I would argue that the people who are changing behavior right now better than anyone else in the world are these companies that started out as toys, these companies that were nice to have, that everybody dismissed the first time they saw them. And yet within the span of just a few short years, these companies started making hundreds of millions of dollars, if not billions of dollars, by changing the daily habits and behaviors of hundreds of millions, if not billions of users. Who am I talking about? 
I'm talking about Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and Slack and WhatsApp and uh, Snapchat. These companies that kind of came out of nowhere look like toys and somehow have changed people's behaviors and their lives for good. How do they do it? How do they get people hooked? So this is a book I wrote a few years ago. It's uh, sold over 300,000 copies, and it's a book that's used in every conceivable industry these days, wherever habits need to change. And the goal of this book was to democratize the techniques that are used by some of the world's most habit-forming products, like the Facebooks and Google and Amazon and Twitter, and all these companies, the most valuable companies in the world, so that we can learn their secrets, so that we can understand the psychology behind how they change people's minds, how they change people's behaviors, and fundamentally how they change people's habits, so that it's not just about building frivolous apps and games, but that we can actually improve people's lives by building healthy habits. So let's first start out by understanding what do we mean by this word? What is the definition of a habit? A habit is simply an impulse to do a behavior with little or no conscious thought. It's about half of what you do every single day is spurred purely by habit. And I believe that we are on the precipice of an age where we can use these habits for good that in every conceivable industry, wherever we have behaviors that need habitual change, we can use some very core principles inside product design. That's really my specialty. The book came out of a class that I taught at the Stanford Graduate School of Business for many years. Then I moved over to the Hassel Plattner Institute of Design where I taught for several years about how to design products and services, not individual change, but products and services delivered by businesses that can help people improve their lives by changing their habits. And so what we find is that in every product where we have a habit change, we find the same fundamental pattern. So it doesn't matter what the habit you're trying to change in your uh, customer, your patients, your users, your clients, it doesn't matter. If you are trying to change a consumer habit, you have got to understand where is the hook inside that user experience. What is the definition of a hook? A hook is defined as an experience designed to connect the user's problem with your product with enough frequency to form a habit. Let me say that again, write this down if you can. A hook is an experience designed to connect the user's problem to your product or service with enough frequency to form a habit. And so what we're gonna do for the next few minutes is to understand the same fundamental pattern that we see in all of the products we just described, like Facebook, Twitter, Amazon, WhatsApp, Slack, TikTok. We all see the same four steps and we can use these same product, uh, these same steps in the healthcare industry, and I'll show you some examples in just a minute, to change people's habits. Now, every hook, has these same four steps, a trigger, an action, a reward, and finally an investment. And so we're gonna walk through these four steps so that you can learn how to apply these steps uh, for your own users and customers. Every hook starts with a trigger. A trigger is some kind of call to action. It tells the user or the patient what to do next. Now there are two types of triggers. First of all, we have what's called the external triggers. External triggers, you'll be very familiar with. These are the pings, the dings, the rings, anything in your outside environment that gives you some piece of information for what to do next. Now, you're very familiar with these. You probably get hundreds, if not thousands, of external triggers every day prompting your habits, prompting your behaviors. Now, from a product design perspective, these are important. But what is actually even more important than the external triggers and very few people pay attention to, especially in the healthcare industry, are the internal triggers. Internal triggers is where the information for what to do next is not in our outside environment, but rather is prompted by a piece of information stored inside the user's own head. So what we do in response to being in a certain place around certain people, partaking in certain routines and certain situations, and most frequently when we experience certain emotions, prompts these habits, tells us what to do next. Now the most frequently occurring internal triggers out of the five you see there below, the most frequently occurring internal triggers are right there in the center our emotions, but not just any emotion. 
the most frequent internal triggers are negative emotions, negative emotions. What we do when we're feeling bored or lost or indecisive or fatigued or fearful or anxious, what we do when we experience these negative emotions prompts us to turn to some kind of solution to alleviate that emotional itch. We seek to scratch it with the use of some kind of product or service. You don't believe me? Turns out a few years ago, there was a brilliant study done that found, found that people suffering from clinical depression check email more. Now, why would that be? The theory is that people check email more who are suffering from clinical depression because people who are suffering from clinical depression experience what psychologists call negative valence states. They feel down more frequently than the rest of the population. And so what are they doing to boost their mood, to take their mind off of that uncomfortable emotional state? They're checking email, they're going online, they're using their devices more frequently than the rest of the population. But if we're honest with ourselves, all of us do this to some degree, right? Let me ask you a question. What website or app do people check when they're feeling lonely? Where do we go? Check Facebook, of course. And what about when we're feeling unsure about something? Before we scan our brains to see if we know the answer, what do we do with little or no conscious thought out of habit? We Google it, don't we? And what about when we're feeling bored? You know, between two and four o'clock in the afternoon, you have that big project you don't want to work on right now. Where do you go? Oh, lots of solutions for boredom. You can go to YouTube, Reddit, stock prices, sports scores. Let's check the news to think about somebody else's problem halfway across the world so we don't have to feel this uncomfortable sensation that we don't want to experience. So, how do we use this for good? How do we use the exact same psychology that these tech companies use on us every day? How do we use that to help people live better, happier, healthier, more connected lives? It starts with understanding your customer's internal trigger. I cannot tell you how many companies and services I have worked with over the past decade now who have no idea what their product is doing for people. They tell me about all the functional things and, oh, our whiz-bang doohickey does this and that. But when I ask them, okay, but what's the psychological itch? What is the need, the internal trigger that your product is addressing? They haven't a clue. If you cannot articulate what is the frequently occurring internal trigger, you are just looking to get lucky. You will not change that consumer habit unless you can identify and articulate that consumer itch. And everyone in your company that touches the customer experience needs to also know what real business you are in. You're not in the business of delivering a drug or a service or a healthcare app or uh, 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 whatever kind of patient adherence program. You are in the business of scratching users' psychological itch, identifying that internal trigger and providing a solution to that discomfort. That is your business. Now, let's use a case study here. I like to use examples of companies that people use every day, so I don't like to just focus on the healthcare industry. Let's look broader here. Let's look at Instagram for a, mi a minute. Unbelievably successful company. I'm sure many of you uh, use Instagram. What made Instagram such a habit-forming product? Well, first of all, we have the external triggers, right? How did you first find out about Instagram? Maybe your friend posted a photo on Facebook, maybe word of mouth. Somehow you heard about it. You installed the app on your phone. Now you start getting notifications on your phone that start giving you pings and dings. Those are all forms of external triggers. But what are the internal triggers? What are the internal triggers to using a product like Instagram? I would argue that the internal trigger for Instagram is about the pain of losing a moment, right? When people take a picture of a beautiful sunset or what they had for breakfast, their breakfast isn't telling them, hey, take a picture of me with Instagram. There's no information there in their breakfast of, of eggs and bacon that says that they should take a picture with Instagram, but they want to capture the moment. They want to hold on to it. There's this fear that if they don't take a picture of it, it's lost forever. Now, let me ask you a question. What other company, think maybe 20, 30 years ago, used to own the moment in the photography space, before there was Instagram, before there was the internet, what company used to be all about capturing the moment? Kodak. Of course, you remember the Kodak moment, right? Remember how uh, Kodak used to have these schmaltzy commercials on TV of the puppy dogs running through the grass, the kids who would someday leave the empty nest. My favorite commercial, remember the one they always had of grandma blowing out her last birthday candles? You know what she was doing there, right? Why did Kodak spend billions of dollars and 
a hundred years teaching people about the Kodak moment because they wanted to associate in consumers' minds that when you see a moment like this in your life, capture it with a Kodak camera before it's lost forever. What took Kodak billions in advertising and a hundred years to do, Instagram did with 12 people in 18 months by having Instagram users teach other Instagram users what the product is all about. But of course, Instagram can do things that the Kodak camera never could, right? Because the more we use a product like Instagram, the more we begin to use it for other internal triggers. When we're feeling bored or stressed or lonely or FOMO. Everybody know what FOMO is? Fear of missing out. It's actually in the Merriam-Webster dictionary as of three years ago. It's a real word now in the English language. The fear of missing out feels bad. We don't like that sensation of missing out on something. It's fearful. And so the solution to that emotional discomfort is found with this app in our pockets. Instagram wins. So there's a lot more to be said about internal triggers and external triggers. Unfortunately, we don't have time to go into a lot more depth. There is a lot more in the book that I hope you'll check out. But let's go to the next step of the hook model, the action phase. The action phase is defined as the simplest behavior done in anticipation of a reward. The simplest thing the user can do to get relief from that emotional discomfort. So let me show you a few examples of some habit forming products. And I want you to see how simple the key action is. A scroll on Pinterest, a search on Google, what could be simpler than just pushing the play button on YouTube? These incredibly simple behaviors done in anticipation of an immediate reward. Turns out that there's actually a formula that helps us predict the likelihood of any singular behavior. This comes to us from my colleague at Stanford by the name of BJ Fogg. Fogg tells us that for any human behavior, any human behavior, your patient's behavior, your customer's behavior, your spouse's behavior, your kid's behavior, your behavior, doesn't matter, Online, offline, doesn't make a difference. Every behavior requires three things at the same time. A behavior requires motivation, ability, ability is how easy or difficult something is to do, and a trigger must be present. We just talked all about triggers. Let's talk about motivation, the M in B equals M-A-T. Motivation, according to Edward DC, the father of self-determination theory, he tells us that motivation is about the energy for action, how much we want to do a particular behavior. And here we have these six levers of human motivation that we can pull on to make someone more or less likely to do a particular behavior. Because all of us as human beings, we seek pleasure, we avoid pain. We seek hope, we avoid fear. We seek social acceptance, we avoid social rejection. So every bit of marketing copy, every television commercial, every uh, a website fundamentally is trying to influence you by motivating you through these six levers of motivation. A lot more to be said here, but for the sake of time, let's move on to the next step, or the next part of B equals M-A-T. The A stands for ability. Ability is the capacity to do a particular action, how easy or difficult something is to do. A principle of user behavioral design we've known for decades now is that the easier something is to do, the more likely people are to do it. It's really common sense. So here again, we have these six levers of motivation that, I'm sorry, these six levers of ability that we can use to make someone more or less likely to do a particular behavior based on how much time something takes, how much money something costs, how much physical effort is associated with the task? Brain cycles, this is a big one when it comes to the healthcare industry because the harder something is to understand, the less likely people are to do it. Social deviance says that we become more likely to do a particular behavior when we see other people like us doing it. And finally, non-routine says that we become more likely to do something simply for the fact that we have done it before in the past. And this is why habits are so important. What do we call a behavior that gets easier the more we do it? That action is called practice, right? The easier, or the more often we do it, the easier it becomes and the more likely we are to continue to do it in the future. So we can actually plot out these three factors of B equals MAT on this conceptual graph. And if your customers, your users, your patients, doesn't matter, if they are not doing a particular behavior, if you have an amazing uh, medical device or, or patients aren't adhering to a certain regimen, there is only one of three reasons why they are not doing that behavior. Either 
They lack sufficient motivation on the y-axis. They lack ability. The behavior is too hard. If it's far right, they, it's to, the ability, the, uh, uh, the, the behavior is easy to do. If it's on the far left, the behavior is very hard to do. And only when the user has sufficient ability on that x-axis and sufficient motivation, they cross that red threshold. And if and only if a trigger is present, the behavior will occur. Every time, online, offline, your behavior, your customer's behavior, doesn't matter. Every behavior always requires these three factors for every single action. If the behavior is not occurring, it's only because one of these three things are missing. So let, let's make this more concrete. Let me give you an example here in, in, uh, for an a online example. You can, uh, many of you are familiar with Enterprise Rent-A-Car. It's the, the country's largest rental car company. This is what this company's website used to look like a few years ago. Um, uh, and I want you to ask yourself on this website, what is the intended behavior? What does Enterprise Rent-A-Car, as well as Enterprise Rent-A-Car's customers, if you visited this site, what do you think is the intended behavior? What does enterprise want you to do? What would you want to do as a consumer wanting a rent-a-car? What would you want to do here? What's the behavior? You would want to reserve a car, right? Well, look at all this stuff on the page that is not that. Look at all the distractions on this page that is anything but booking a vehicle to rent, right? All of this unnecessary clutter. Now I'm gonna show you what Enterprise Rent-A-Car's website looks like today. And I want you to see how much cleaner, how much easier, how much cognitive load they have removed to get the user to do what they have designed for them to do, what they intend them to do, what the user and the company wants the person to do. Look at this. You see this? Talk about simplicity, talk about removing steps, talk about removing cognitive load, effort, to just do the thing you want the customer to do on this page, make the reservation. So this is a pretty extreme example online, but I wanna take this to the healthcare industry. What can we learn here? I wanna tell you about a company called Show that I, I, uh, I spoke with the, the founder many years ago. And the founder, this is a, a company that uh, uh, sells vitamins, right? Uh, daily use vitamins. And they, she came to me and she said that there were a few problems that, that she found with, with traditional vitamins, that most people, when they took their vitamins, uh, they, they wouldn't take them very consistently. They would buy the vitamins, but then they would forget to take them. That was a big barrier for why, why uh, people don't take their vitamins. They simply forget to take them. And so what she realized was that, that there was a lot of cognitive load to remember to take your vitamin, that you have to, you know, you have to take the, the vitamin out of the jar, put it in one of those container things that say Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of physical effort. Uh, it's, it's, it's not in anybody's routine. It's a lot of cognitive load. You don't remember if you refilled it, if you did make that effort. So here's what they did. They designed the experience of remembering to take your vitamins right into the dispenser. So every day you look at your vitamin, notice by the way, how this is designed. This is not designed to be put in some counter, into some closet somewhere. This is designed to be left out, right? It's designed to be something that you can put uh, in your kitchen or in your bathroom so that you see it every day. You have a clear external trigger. Now, if you don't know whether you took your vitamin, all you have to do is look on the container itself and it says right there, it's Monday. And if, if the date isn't Monday, you click, you actually pull the, 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 this little lever device on the, the vitamin dispenser and it twists to tell you, oh, you've taken your vitamin for the next day, for example. So they decrease the cognitive load associated with forgetting, oh, did I take the vitamin or did I not take the vitamin? That actually was getting people uh, to not take their vitamin because they were worried that they were taking it twice in one day. They were meeting users where they are. They were figuring out what is in the customer's way, what kind of friction can they remove? Let me give you another wonderful example. Uh, several years ago, I worked with a, a company, a pharmaceutical company, that made a preventative asthma inhaler. And the problem they had was that this, uh, this inhaler was not something that people were used to thinking about in the way they wanted them to think about. There was a lot of cognitive load to understanding how to use it properly. Here was the problem, that traditionally, an asthma inhaler uh, people who suffer from asthma only use when they are experiencing an asthma attack. So where do they put their inhaler? They put it in their backpack, they put it in their purse, they take around, it around with them throughout the day, right? That's what they have the habit of. When I feel an asthma attack coming on, I take a puff. This 
product, however, was a preventative device. They wanted people to get into the habit of taking a puff in the morning and taking a puff at night, and that's it. And they found that even though the, the, the medication worked beautifully, people were not getting into the habit. And here's why. Because they were taking their inhalers and they were putting them the same place they put their old inhalers, in their backpack, in their purse, and they would forget to do the two puffs a day. And so the, this company spent, I'm not exaggerating, millions of dollars researching how to build a fancy app and a fancy inhaler and a technology and a Bluetooth this, and they just spent tons of money trying to figure out a high-tech solution. And the ultimate solution that, that they came up with was something so simple, it cost just pennies. They figured out that if they got people to not put their inhaler in their purse or their backpack and instead put it near their toothbrush, it could provide an external trigger to tell them to take those two puffs. So you see one in the morning, one in the night. If you use the inhaler first thing in the morning when you wake up, right after you brush your teeth, and they actually instructed people, put this in your bathroom next to your toothbrush because that's an existing habit that you could glob onto. That it clearly told them, take, take a puff and then put it in the nighttime tray so you'll know it's ready for you next time. Very simple solution, cost pennies to, to create something like this knowing that the key problem was not the technology. It didn't require some, some super fancy education program. It didn't require a lot of motivation. It required ability. It required ease. And let me tell you, the number one reason people don't adhere to a, a medication or to using a pharmaceutical device is not that they don't want to. It's that it's too difficult to do that behavior. So remember, B equals MAT. You have to have sufficient motivation. You have to have a trigger. But most importantly is ability. Make that behavior as easy as possible to do. Now, let's move on to the third step of the hook model, the reward phase. So this is where people get what they came for. It's where they get that reward, that itch is scratched from that internal trigger. Now, when we talk about rewards, we have to talk about the brain. And in particular, an area of the brain called the nucleus accumbens, which was first studied by two Canadian researchers by the name of Olds and Milner back in the 1940s. They did these amazing experiments where they connected an electrode to a special part of the brain called the nucleus accumbens. And that, that nucleus accumbens was connected to a, a little electrode that the lab animal could activate whenever they wanted. And what they found was that these lab animals would forgo food water, they would run across painful electrified grids just to activate this part of the brain again and again and again. In later experiments done on people, when people were given a little button to press on, and every time they pressed on this button, they would receive an electrical jolt to their nucleus accumbens, they did so thousands of times. Some of the people in the studies had to have the machines forcibly removed from them to get them to stop activating this part of the brain. Well, it turns out you don't need electrodes in people's brains to activate their nucleus accumbens. All sorts of things that you use every single day activate this very same part of the brain. Luxury goods, sex, junk food, certain chemicals, and of course, right there in the center, our technology. All of these things activate the very same part of the brain. Now, it turns out that Olds and Milner assumed the purpose of the nucleus accumbens was to stimulate pleasure right? Why else would lab animals and later people incessantly activate this part of the brain if it wasn't because it felt good, right? Not exactly. It turns out what we now know that Olds and Milner never did is that the nucleus accumbens becomes most active in anticipation of the reward. As you can see here from this fMRI study, it becomes most active when we think we're going to get a reward. But when we actually get the thing we crave, the thing we want, the thing that we think is going to make us finally happy and feel good, that's when the nucleus accumbens becomes less active. So the way the brain gets us to act is not by making us feel good per se, but in fact, it's by stimulating this itch that we seek to scratch, what we call the stress of desire. And there is actually a way that you can supercharge this response. Did you know that there's a way that I can teach you for how you can, you can create desire, how you can actually manufacture wanting? Does anybody want to know how to manufacture desire? Anybody curious? I'm doing it to you right now. That by taking that long pause 
and stop and the fact that I stopped talking for a few quick seconds, some of you perked up. Why did he stop talking? What's he gonna say? What's the answer to the question? And what I just did to you right now was an example of a variable reward because the unknown is fascinating. Variability causes us to engage, it causes us to focus, and it is highly habit forming. This of course came out of the work of B.F. Skinner, the father of operant conditioning. Skinner with these pigeons, he put them in a little box that we today call the Skinner box, and he let these pigeons peck at a disc. And every time they would peck at the disc, he would give them a little food pellet, a little reward. And so very quickly, he could train these pigeons to peck at the disc whenever they were hungry. By the way, if the pigeon wasn't hungry, if there wasn't the internal trigger, if there wasn't a the desire, he couldn't make the pigeons peck at the disc. They had to have the internal trigger of hunger. But if the pigeon was hungry, they could peck at the disc and get a reward. Great. That's called operant conditioning. This is how we train a puppy or our kids, <laughs> basically through these rewards. Now, one day, something unusual happened. One day, Skinner walked into the lab and he noticed that he didn't have enough of these food pellets. He'd run out of them. He had a short supply. And so he couldn't afford to give the remaining pellets to the pigeons every time they pecked at the disc. He could only afford to give it to them once in a while. So sometimes the pigeon would peck at the disc, nothing would come out, no food pellet, no reward. The next time the pigeon would peck the disc, they would receive a reward. And what Skinner observed was that the rate of response, the number of times the pigeon pecked at the disc, increased when the reward was given on a variable schedule of reinforcement. Why does this happen? Because variability spikes activity in the nucleus accumbens, creating this desirous response, this wanting reflex. And so in all sorts of products and services, you will find one or more of these three types of variable rewards. Rewards of the tribe, rewards of the hunt, and rewards of the self. Let me introduce these to you briefly. Rewards of the tribe is all about the search for social rewards. These are things that feel good, that come from other people, and have this element of variability. So empathetic joy, feeling good because someone else feels good, partnership, uh, uh, competition, cooperation, all of these things feel good, come from other people, and have this element of variability. Best example, of course, is social media. When you log into Facebook or Instagram or whatever other social media site, LinkedIn, for example, you're never quite sure what you're going to see. What do people post? What do the comments say? How many likes does something get? Right? So lots of examples of, of uh, these social rewards in social media, of course. Funny enough, I just saw today uh, in the Washington Post uh, how this is being used in healthcare. There's a, a wonderful organization that I've, I've worked with that I advised on behavioral design, a group of doctors that got together to, to uh, increase voter registration for this upcoming election. And the way they are doing it is by working with MDs inside hospitals to get them to ask their patients if they are registered to vote and then making that as easy as possible to get more uh, uh, voters to register. Now, their problem was not that patients didn't want to register to vote. They were, patients were, were very happy to register to vote and that this company makes it very, or this nonprofit makes it very easy to do so. The problem was getting doctors to change their behavior. So here's what they did they set up a competition. And so you can see that little chart over there in the bottom right, they set up a competition between Duke and UNC to see where, uh, who, who could register more voters at their specific hospital facilities. And so that bit of competition, that variability, that rewards of the tribe is what drives this key variable reward. And the second type of variable reward is called rewards of the hunt. Rewards of the hunt are all about the search for material possessions, uh, uh, of food. And in modern society, we buy these things with money. So when people think of variable rewards, oftentimes they think of gambling, right? They think about these games of chance where when you play one of these slot machines, for example, there's variability around what you might win when you play one of these games. Now, interestingly enough, we see the same exact psychology at work online. Have you noticed how everything today has a feed? Have you noticed that? How so many products online, especially the ones we use on our mobile devices, why does everything have a feed these days? Well, consider, for example, LinkedIn. When you go on LinkedIn, 
and you open up the, the, the page there, maybe the first thing isn't very interesting, and maybe the second thing isn't very interesting, but oh, maybe the third or fourth is interesting. And what do you have to do to see more interesting content? What do you have to do? Well, just like pulling on a slot machine, you have to keep scrolling and scrolling, just like a slot machine, but in reverse, looking for more of that interesting content. The last type of variable reward is called the rewards of the self. Rewards of the self are things that feel good, that have this element of variability, but don't come from other people and aren't about the search for material or information rewards. These are things that feel good in and of themselves. They're intrinsically pleasurable. It's about the search for mastery, competency, and control. Best example online is gameplay, right? So when people play Candy Crush or um, uh, Angry Birds or who knows what other game, many of these games you're not playing with other people. You're not winning anything in terms of material rewards, but there's something fun and engaging about the next level, the next achievement, the next accomplishment. Now, I know everybody listening today, you're all very serious healthcare pro professionals and business people. None of you play these online games, I'm sure, but I bet you play this game every single day. Let me know if this looks familiar. Your email inbox, right? Checking those unread messages, uh, opening it up and finishing the to-dos on your to-do list. Or, or, or the thing that always gets me is that one notification on my home screen that I just have to open to clear it away are all examples of variable rewards of the self, the search for mastery, consistency, competency, and control. Now, the point of the variable reward phase, this isn't some cheesy gamification technique. Gamification generally does not work, and we can talk about why it doesn't work in a minute. The idea here is to authentically scratch the user's itch. So if the user's itch is loneliness, well, we have to connect them to other people. But if, if their internal trigger is uncertainty, well, then we have to give them assurance. The idea here is that we always need to connect the internal trigger with the variable reward. If there isn't a match there, the product will not form a user habit. So we wanna give the user what they came for, scratch their itch, and yet insert a bit of variability to leave them wanting more. Finally, the last step of the hook model is the investment phase. The investment phase is, is uh, by definition, something that increases the likelihood of the user returning by getting the user to put something into the product in anticipation of some kind of future reward. It's not about immediate gratification. It's something the user will benefit from in the future. So investments increase the likelihood of the user passing through the hook in the future in two ways. The first way is by loading the next trigger, loading the next trigger, something the user did to bring themselves back. Okay, so for example, on WhatsApp, when you send someone a message on WhatsApp, you don't get any kind of points or badges. There's no immediate gratification. What you're doing when you send someone a message on WhatsApp or any number of other messaging platforms, you can substitute Slack or SMS or whatever, any messaging system, there's no immediate gratification. But when you send someone that message, you are loading the next trigger because you're likely to get a reply. And that reply, that red notification icon, you'll recognize now as an external trigger that prompts you through the hook once again. So this isn't some piece of cheesy, spammy marketing that you're sending the customer or user. It's something that they did for themselves to bring themselves back. The second way that investments increase the likelihood of the next pass through the hook is by storing value. Now, storing value is a really, really big deal because you see most products and services offline, things that are made of bits, I'm sorry, things that are made of atoms as opposed to bits, all of these physical things, they lose value with wear and tear. So th this clothing, uh, my desk, this lamp, everything in the physical world depreciates with wear and tear. But habit-forming products should do the opposite. Habit-forming products don't depreciate with wear and tear. They appreciate with use. They get better and better the more we interact with them. And that is revolutionary. So, for example, the more content you upload to a site, for example, the more content you put into Google Drive or Dropbox, the better it becomes as your cloud storage solution. 
the more data you give a service. So for example, if you use mint.com or Pinterest or Facebook, any of these sites, they get better and better the more data you give them. They are making the site for you in real time for a customer set of one based on your data. If you were to log into my Pinterest account or my Facebook account, it wouldn't be very interesting for you because it's been customized for me based on the data I have given these platforms. Followers, the more followers someone has, the better the product is as a way to reach their audience. So let's say tomorrow Twitter said, hey, you know what? Um, Twitter's not free anymore, okay? You're gonna have to start paying if you wanna use Twitter. Who is more likely to pay? Will it be someone with 10 followers or with 10,000 followers? Of course, it's gonna be the person with 10,000 followers because they've stored all this value in the form of their follower count. And finally, reputation. Reputation is a form of stored value that we can literally take to the bank because customers on Upwork, eBay, Airbnb, the better their reputation score, the harder it is to leave. So think about it. Even if there was a better product or service that came along, how likely would you be to leave if you had this great reputation built up on one of these platforms? It's kind of hard to do. Which brings me to this whole cold, hard conclusion that it is not necessarily the best product that wins. Having the best product is table stakes. It's about who can capture the monopoly of the mind, the first to mind solution that we turn to with little or no conscious thought out of habit by following through these four basic steps of a trigger, action, reward, and investment. This is how customer preferences are shaped, how tastes are formed, and how these habits take hold. So this is the most important slide of the presentation, the five fundamental questions that you have to ask yourself if you are trying to change a consumer habit. Number one, what is the internal trigger that your product is addressing? Number two, what's the external trigger that prompts your user to action? Number three, what's the simple behavior done in anticipation of reward? Number four, is the reward fulfilling and yet leaves the user wanting more? And then finally, what's the bit of work done to increase the likelihood of the next pass through the hook? Now, before I take some questions, there's one more thing I'd like to discuss, which is the morality of manipulation. Because I'm pretty sure that some of you, while I was giving this presentation, were thinking, yeesh, is this okay to do to people? Is this kosher to use their hidden psychology to, to change their behavior? And if you had that reaction, I say bravo. Because look, any form of design, any form of design, even if it's for the customer's own good, is a form of manipulation, especially if there's a commercial interest in, at heart. So we need to be very conscious about how we use these techniques because look, these technologies are what we take to bed with us every night. It's the first thing we reach for in the morning before we even say hello to our loved ones. And so we need to be very careful about how we use these technologies and techniques responsibly to help people live happier, healthier, more connected lives. And so what I encourage you to do is to help people find something meaningful, to engage them in something important, to use these behavior change principles to help people live better. And so I, I wanna end with the words of Gandhi to encourage you to build the change that you wish to see in the world. And with that, I'd love to take some questions, but before I do, I have a quick favor to ask. If you'd kindly go to this URL, opinion2.us, uh, that's the URL, opinion2.us. You can see it there on your screen. If you happen to have a phone handy, you can point your camera right at that QR code and it'll take you to uh, a, a link for a very brief survey. Would love to know what you thought. It's only five questions that I'd love to get your take on. Uh, and then if, you, if we don't get time to answer your questions today, please feel free to visit me at nearandfar.com. You can see the URL right there, near is spelled like my first name, nirandfar.com. And if I don't get to your questions, feel free to reach out to me and I'd be happy to, uh, if you contact me through my site, I'd be happy to answer your question later on. And with that, I think we have some time for a few questions at least, right? Um, thank you so much, Nir. Um, I'm gonna do a quick presentation um, to about 10 minutes and then we'll do Q&A, uh, if that's Sounds okay. Good. All right, awesome. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, that was uh, fantastic. So thank you so much. Um, and again, um, you all know who I am by now, but uh, my name again is Divya and I lead our product and engineering teams here at Verda. Um, and I'm kind of excited to walk through what we do here at Verda and tie together some of the things that Amir and Jody talked about just kind of as a real world case study. Um, so, you know, just a little bit of a background about me. 
Um, I started my journey in this space with my master's in computational biology and bioinformatics. And that's where I first really fell in love with the power of data and technology to help um, and affect health outcomes. And since then, I've been building expertise in consumer-facing technology products, as well as spending a few years in the logistics space, um, looking at you know, using technology to pro provide leverage for operationally complex businesses like healthcare delivery. Um, I'm really thrilled to be applying all those learnings and some new learnings I got from today's presentation um, to building engaging products to really supercharge the clinician and patient interface and to ensure the highest quality care and outcomes for our patients. Um, so with that, let me kind of dive into a little bit of um, how we're thinking about this here at Verda. Let's see, got it. Um, so, you know, here at Verda, um, we have this um, amazing opportunity to use both technology and clinical practice to drive and sustain behavior change. Um, and it puts us in a really unique position. I'd love to share a little bit more about that. So just first to take a small step back, um, these new care delivery models are even more critical right now during COVID-19. So, um, you know, there's underlying conditions, that increased risk of hospitalization for patients, and one of those is type 2 diabetes. So this makes Verda particularly relevant right now for two different reasons, well, many different reasons, but in particular two as they relate to COVID. One is this underlying condition of type 2 diabetes um, is, you know, less desirable than ever. And um, you know, the opportunity to reverse is, is particularly valuable. Um, but our remote care delivery is also particularly important because our diabetic patients really um, don't wanna put themselves at risk by seeking in-person care. Um, and so the, the remote platform um, is extra relevant right now. Um, so just to you know, got back into how we approached um, diabetes reversal and sustained behavior change here at Verda. Um, we know that most patients come to Verda with all kinds of challenges related to type 2 diabetes. So, you know, in order to treat our patients um, and sustain this behavior change, we need to tackle the whole patient. We need to look at their stress levels, their support network, their relationships with food, history, potentially decades long history of failed attempts for change. Um, feelings of shame. So we really need to look at this holistically um, when we are treating our patients here at Verda. Oops. So um, Verda leverages the latest science on behavior change and we deliver this through our technology as well as through our clinical team. And you know, we're looking at CBT, we're looking at motivational interviewing, smart goal setting, growth mindset, mindfulness, um, and our coaches are trained um, on many of these, th on you know many of these methods, and we also build them into our product to create a holistic experience for our patients to tackle some of those challenges that we looked at on the previous slide. Um, we also have kind of an unfair advantage here at Verda in sustaining behavior change because um, as our medical treatment starts working for our patients and taking hold, it creates a strong intrinsic motivation. It creates some biochemical changes. Um, that uh, you know really help um, drive and sustain some of these behavior changes. So you know we um, they start seeing rapid results um, that are very visible. You know they start seeing their weight drop. They are able to reduce their medication. They start seeing their numbers go down. This creates a positive intrinsic feedback loop, as well as a biochemical change that starts curbing their cravings. Um, this coupled with high frequency coaching and behavior change creates this amazing quick loop um, and starts creating you know, almost a flywheel effect. This works within the first week of starting Verda um, and you know, allows patients to see results and stay motivated um, and see the results that we then work to sustain. Um, one of the amazing benefits of being able to deliver through our remote care platform is the access to the data um, that we're collecting from our patients and the data-driven triggers that we're allowed to provide to our patients and to our health coaches to really um, address some of these behavioral challenges. So on the left side of the screen, you'll see the multitude of rich data we're getting from our patients and collecting continuously that we are able to then process and look at to personalize the treatment we provide to our patients. And what we can do with it then is we're able to um, have a continuous um, estimate of patient success. We know how to spend our time, which patients to prioritize, how to 
um, intervene. We're able to create timely alerts and suggested interventions for our patients. Um, and we're allowed to really personalize the e-learning and the content we're providing to our patients to help them learn how to sustain their behavior change. And really think about um, you know, some of those things that Nir just told us about. I'm um, thinking about um, we're able to use this data and these surfaces to think about the right um, triggers and um, you know, there, there's so much more we have to learn, but at least we have that opportunity because we have access to that data. Um, during this COVID-19 pandemic, human connection is even more important than ever. Our patients that were, you know, Jody was talking about patients that were um, isolated, not uncommon for this demographic, um, even more relevant now. Um, and one of the ways Verda is able to tackle this is through our health coaching and our patient community. So, you know, this doesn't make up for, of course, in-person family and friend interaction, but it does um, help mitigate some of those effects. So we're able to couple our health coaching with some of these other things we're talking about, data-driven triggers, of course, our patient community, um, our e-learning curriculum. And as we look at patients with more severe behavioral or mental health um, conditions, we will partner with a P their PCP to refer out to make sure patients are getting the support they need. Um, quick walkthrough of our patient experience uh, at Verda. So we have our onboarding phase, our diabetes reversal phase that I talked a little bit about with our flywheel, and then we talk about our sustained success phase. So our onboarding phase um, is uh, probably a little bit more intensive than the onboarding phase for many other technology products. We have a marketing enrollment team with an in-person in -person team, um, or I mean, I guess remote in-person uh, people <laughs> um, that are helping our patients through this funnel. Um, and they, you know, they might have to get labs, they might have to get certain screenings, and then they get an introduction to our clinical team. They get to meet their provider, learn more about the treatment, create a care plan. Um, they get a welcome kit with a lot of these tools um, that they'll use in their continuous monitoring, um, a connected scale, the glucometer, et cetera. And then they begin their journey through a guided educational curriculum um, as they start um, being introduced to their health coach and beginning their treatment. As we go into our diabetes reversal phase, you know, we have our nutritional changes and our medical nutritional therapy that's at the core of the Verda treatment. Then we have an app through which we're able to deliver health coaching, biomarker logging, continuous um, monitoring. And um, this allows both our health coaches and our physicians to provide real-time care, including physician-led deep prescription based on how those biomarkers are changing, how quickly blood glucose is dropping. Um, you know, we can really create that feedback loop to create a safe and satisfying experience for our patients as they enter this reversal phase. Um, the third phase, the sustained success phase, is where we really start thinking about um, all of the tools that we can use to sustain behavior change. So, you know, we see the reversal, um, patients are um, doing fantastic. But as we all know, um, you know, to sustain this over a period of months or years, we need to meet patients where they are. Um, life happens, life stressors happen, things change for our patients. Um, and this is where we can really use our platform and our technology to think about um, you know, triggers and um, things like that in our app that can bring patients back to where they were and um, you know, bring them what they need at different points in their life. So we have our care team, of course, we have our providers and we have our coaches. They're always there to provide um, the personalized care our patients need. But we also have our remote monitoring, um, our remote screening. So we really can kind of start to detect when our patients might need us or might need different things from us um, and tailor our treatment. And then we have our AI-driven nudges, we have our e-learning platform, and we have our patient um, community that can help us drive accountability and motivation um, for our patients. Oops. Great. Um, so this combined approach is showing um, amazing results. We're seeing, you know, 90% um, retention rate at one year, um, which is um, amazing for um, a behavior change chronic disease program. And um, just to quickly run through some of our outcomes, um, Verda has the longest running diabetes reversal clinical trial. Um, and we have outcomes that are peer reviewed. We've had six publications, um, not only on our clinical trial around diabetes reversal, but other um, health outcomes that we've seen in our patients, reducing um, cardiovascular marker, uh, markers for cardiovascular risk. Um, non-fatty acid liver disease, sleep quality, et cetera. 
And, um, you know, we have peer reviewed results on our one year um, diabetes reversal rates. We've seen a 60% um, reversal rate, as well as an additional, the additional 40% in addition to those 60% are well on their way to reversal. They are still seeing an A1C reduction, significant medication um, elimination, um, you know, substantial weight loss, et cetera. Um, so, these outcomes that we're driving through this combination of clinical practice and technology um, is showing sustained results. Um, not only in our clinical trial, but also in the real world, we're seeing this in our employer populations. And we just have a few examples here to show the different types of patients that this is working with. You know, this isn't just for a particular type of patient. We're seeing U.S. Foods, which is primarily truck drivers. We're seeing Nielsen, a lot of, you know, white collar knowledge workers. We're seeing Tippecanoe County, which is government workers, police officers. Um, so um, we're seeing this working across a whole lot of different types of populations, and we're really looking forward to using our technology platform, behavior change, um, and be different behavior change tactics to really make sure that our core medical nutritional therapy that we know works is accessible to all different types of patients. Um, so just the last slide, you know, we're seeing three and a half year sustainability through this combination of clinical um, and technological, um, you know, behavior change that we're driving um, and we're seeing sustained results through di diabetes prescription reduction in prescriptions reduction in hba1c which is um as uh, jody was saying the our the kind of bl blood sugar um measure over the last few months and um body weight so um i really enjoyed the opportunity to kind of share this case study tie some of these things together um, but i do want to make sure we leave enough room for q a so um, with that, I will open up the floor. Um, I see a couple of questions that we already have here. So um, I'll just start fielding these out. So my the first question I have here is for Nir. Um, Nir, what has been your experience working with healthcare clients on building products that keep patients happy and engaged? And do you think this is gonna change post COVID? Yeah, so I've, I've worked with uh, several uh, healthcare initiatives. Some I, I can talk about, and I put in the presentations, others I can't talk about <laughs> publicly. But uh, the, the experience is that, you know, patient adherence is such a big problem. It is, it is uh, there are few problems as great as, as uh, having the medication, having the medical device, and yet people don't use the device or don't take their medication. It's incredibly frustrating. Uh, and, and so that's where I come in. So that's where my experience has, has been, uh, for most companies, um, uh, post COVID. I mean, I think this is, this is perhaps the silver lining is that, um, that a crisis facilitates change. I mean, we're seeing all kinds of, uh, barriers, uh, regulatory barriers and added red tape that didn't really need to be there in the first place kind of melt away now that, uh, that COVID is here and we have to do more telemedicine, for example, all kinds of things that, that weren't previously possible uh, because of all kinds of red tape are now uh, are possible. So I think this is a great time for opportunity and experimentation uh, now that we, you know, we should make the most of this, uh, of this unfortunate situation to make sure that we can make lasting change that, uh, that, that, that helps people even post-crisis. Excellent. Thank you. Um, next question um, for Jody. Um, Jody, what are some examples of using SDOH and advanced data analytics to drive member engagement? Yeah, that's a great um, question. I think most relevant to um, the discussion is how WellTuck uses um, consumer data and predictive analytics to connect the right people to the right connect partner in, in our ecosystem. And so WellTuck uses consumer data and predictive analytics and um, a use cases we helped a large employer connect the right people, the high risk and rising risk folks to a connect partner. Um, this one specifically was Telespine, which is a uh, remote back pain management um, and telehealth coaching program. Um, and it was, and, and we were able to get it to those who needed it most and by what channel um, that they would be most receptive. And this proactive targeting helped this employer and in and this population, um, uh, it resulted in a 400% in a increase in, in engagement. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Nir, uh, next question back to you. 
Um, what advice do you have for CEOs and healthcare leaders in the audience who are looking to bring on digital health solutions, but maybe have a sea of options to choose from? How do you spot digital health products that hook versus don't um, and the ones that work versus don't? Yeah, so I, I think that a uh, conceptual framework is, is the right uh, lens to look through that um, I think that that you know a lot of companies out there are banking on uh, either good intentions or lab outcomes and I think that that you know things can change when you actually get out into the world that uh, people live busy messy lives and many times I, I worked with with one uh, a medical device manufacturer where the product worked beautifully. I can't talk too much about it, but the product worked beautifully in a lab setting. But when they went to people's homes, uh, the biggest problem was that people couldn't find the device in their home. Like their home was a mess and they put it somewhere and they couldn't remember where it was and they didn't use it because they didn't see it. Uh, simple things like that, you know, the, 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 the real world can sometimes take some some punishing costs that we don't predict in, in a lab setting. So what I would look for is some kind of perceptual model. So the idea behind the hook model is that you can use it as kind of a map to say, okay, where are the triggers? What's the external trigger? What's the internal trigger? Is the action easy enough to do? Is there a variable reward component? Which variable reward is being used of the three types? Are there multiple opportunities? What's the investment that makes the product better and better with use? So that if long-term engagement is the goal, you have a, a theoretical framework to run the product through to say, okay, well, if it's brand new, do, have we covered all the bases? Of course, once the product is in market, well, you know, that becomes much easier, right? Then you can say, well, what, is, what does uh, uh, D30, D60, D90, uh, one-year retention start looking like? You have that metric, you have those metrics. Yeah, that's really helpful. And uh, I can relate about losing devices in my home. <laughs> Especially right now during COVID, I'm like, where's my phone? Um, so, um, Nir, another question for you: um, How can you apply the hooked canvas to assess health apps? Uh, sorry, uh, how to assess health apps with the the hook? Yeah, I think, I, yeah. Like, yes. You know, how do we take this framework to kind of assess different um, health apps or you know health programs that are being you know offered through the app store? Or, um, through yeah, technology. No, yeah so I, I think it's it's uh, it's again running it through this perceptual uh, uh, sorry conceptual framework of identifying okay are these are these components that are critical for all habit forming products do they exist can you you should be able to you know interacting with the product uh, you should very quickly be able to uh, to be able to check those boxes and say okay it, it has the proper uh, patterns followed for a habit forming experience it's helpful um, great. Jody. another quick question for you. Um, would you say customizing outreach based on individual customer needs and scalability are trade-offs to one another? Um, for example, how do payers, providers, employers balance customization versus scalability? And who are the key stakeholders um, to consider during this in different touch points um, when we think about customization versus scalability? Yeah, I mean, simply the answer to um, the trade-offs between outreach and scalability, um, the answer is no. Um, well Talk for over the last decade has cracked the code on kind of mass personalization. And so we use data and machine learning to understand the individual needs and risks and preferences. Um, and then our ability to connect people with the right resources at the right time to drive action. So um, the answer is no, there's no trade-off. I think, I think both are, are not even possible, but plausible. And um, you know, some plans have tried to do this internally, but they're limited, they're limited by the data assets, you know, the left side of that, that slide where it's just the 10% clinical care and, and what's been coded. And so, um, and they're also limited by channels on how to engage. And so you really need kind of a multimodal, multi-channel approach to, um, to wrap your arms around people to engage them. And so we work with our clients to write um, barrier breaking messages, align the right rewards um, to mo motivate action um, in a personalized way. Thank you, Jody.
Um, all right, we, I think we have time for one more question and then we're gonna wrap up. Um, so thanks everyone. Amir, one last question for you. Um, this is kind of COVID specific, but um, you know, COVID has kind of caused massive disruptions for patients in their daily routines and in their world and maybe adapting to technology or losing a job or feeling isolated. Um, do you have any lessons learned from this pandemic and how it's related to um, Hooked? Like, you know, that, has anything changed? Um, what can we learn? Yeah, so, um, yeah, th this actually uh, touches on, uh, I'm, I'm hesitating because I don't want to seem too self-promotional here, <laughs> but, but Hooked is my first book. My second book that just came out is called Indistractable, and Indistractable is about how to uh, how to break bad habits. If Hooked is about how to build good habits, Indistractable is how to break those bad habits. And we've seen uh, a, an amazing increase in distractibility uh, because of COVID. And, and this is because the, 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 the onslaught of internal triggers these days is unprecedented, right? When we think about internal triggers as these uncomfortable emotional states that we seek to escape from, well, you know, over the past several months now, anxiety and uncertainty and fatigue and stress and you know, has all gone through the roof with this uncertain situation that we live in today that uh, uh, we, we are more distractible than ever. And so for some people, they, they take those internal triggers and they can harness that, that, that discomfort to lead them towards uh, adaptive behaviors. For many people, these distraction or these uncomfortable internal straits lead them to many maladaptive behaviors, right? So uh, whether that distraction is you know, stress eating or drinking too much or uh, doom scrolling. There's this new term now called doom scrolling where we can't help ourselves but keep looking at more and more and more news to our own detriment. So I think what we've seen today is that people are, are increasingly distracted. And of course, there are more ways, there are more companies today that are happy to make money off of your distraction, which of course many times uh, is to people's detriment. So I think it's even more important today for companies who do have uh, a mission of improving people's health, of improving people's lives, to know how to cut the, through the clutter and form healthy habits as opposed to these frivolous habits that I think so many people tend to partake in. Awesome, um, thanks. Um, so I think that we are at time. Um, so thanks everyone for joining. Um, Nir, Jody, thank you so much. Um, this has been um, a fantastic session and I kind of love the, the different perspectives we were able to pull together. So um, hopefully the three of us came through learning something and um, you know, our audience did, did as well. Um, so there's a slide up here showing kind of where folks can send follow-up questions and um, Nir shared some of his own as well. Um, so with that, I will wrap up for the morning. So thanks everyone and, um, you know, looking forward to any follow-up folks have offline.